Welcome to Sachs Realty's Tuesday Night Podcast, where we talk about anything and everything real estate. Each week, we deliver expert information, enabling you to make better informed decisions while keeping more money in your pocket. If you're interested in real estate, this is your show. Hey guys, thanks for joining us this evening. Tonight, we're talking about lawns. And you know, no matter whether you're trying to get your house ready to sell you know, curb appeal is everything, you know, lawns make a big part of that. And, uh, or whether you're just trying to make your backyard a little bit nicer tonight, we're going to teach you all about lawn care and things that you can do yourself. And guys, tonight I have, I have the pest and lawn Ginja with us. Thanks so much, Ginja, for joining us. Yeah. Very excited to be here guys. And, uh, we're getting into springtime. It's time to slay those lawns. Absolutely. Let's talk about how you started slaying lawns in the first place, man. How long you've been doing this stuff? You know, I've been in the industry for about 18 years. Um, I started out doing door-to-door -door sales a long time ago, um, and then I transitioned into the service company about 14 years ago. And lawn care was one of those uh, options that people just kept asking for over and over and over. And one thing I learned real quick, everybody ends up with lawn problems. So I developed a five-step process. People can get out on the lawns, diagnose their own lawns, put steps in place so they can keep it green lush and get the envy of the neighborhood and i know you have an amazing youtube channel guys all of his links are below he also he's developing an online course uh, that you can become a master of lawn care uh, but we're going to talk about some of the top things i'm todd Sachs. i'm a broker and founder of Sachs realty we're a maryland real estate brokerage we help buyer sellers renters and tenants of both residential and commercial real estate and if you're anywhere else in the country and you need an agent Feel free to reach out. I have an amazing broker network all over the country. Uh, make sure that you are well taken care of. So you're currently, I mean, you have a lawn care business right now, right? I mean, you're actively taking care of lawns. Yeah, so it's all green pest control and lawn care out of Provo, Utah. Um, we are currently getting into our lawn season and every year ends up being a little different. <laughs> Some, of, And it all depends on uh watering and how much water that we get because we're in a desert climate now for our audience watching and listening uh, are we going to talk about things that can apply to everybody all around yep. the united states no matter what time you know what climate zone they're in absolutely so some of these things are just fundamental right i mean it's so we'll kind of dive right in on some of those things so you know what are like the first steps what's the most important thing about having a nice lawn you know the number one thing and i i get on thousands of lawns um but the number one issue is always proper watering if if you know your watering is on point and you know how many inches per week and yes i said inches per week everybody wants to know how many minutes the correct answer is how many inches per week that you put down uh, it doesn't matter whether you water twice a week or seven days a week, it matters how much water is actually getting into the soil and saturating the soil. You need about six to eight inches of water saturation. You don't want it too wet, but you never want the soil to dry out. So we're talking about six to eight inches of water saturation. Is that a week, a month? Now, keep in mind, when I talk about six to eight inches of water saturation, we were just talking about the total density that we want to see moisture penetrating into the soil. The primary reason behind that is, is we want uh, root depth to go down. Now, there's some regions of California where you're going to get shale about two inches under, and we're not so concerned about water depth as much as we are just replacing evaporation. So there are a few... Um, a few types of soil matter that's going to make things a little bit different, but overall we want water penetration about six to eight inches for the roots to chase. So when you put those sprinklers on, I mean, you want to make sure that you're putting enough down that it gets down about six yeah. inches. And essentially what we're doing is we're chasing water evaporation. That's it. So you're going to have what's called an extension to your agricultural department in every single state. They should have a co-parent corporation that is not necessarily affiliated with the agricultural extensions department called Save the Flow. And their only job is to help you 
save water. Now, I've got a few issues with save the flow because they typically just tell you to stop watering and that's not the case. What we want to ask them is if they have a chart on how many inches of water per week that you need. Now, if you go to our website at milegreen.com forward slash watering, you can see that we have a longitudinal study for our local area of Salt Lake City. And in the month of March, we're not watering. It's usually not necessarily. Month of April, usually not necessary. But you'll see the key points are don't let the soil dry out. That just means you have to get the hose out and lightly water it. Once we get into May, you're about an inch of water, fighting an inch of water of evaporation. And so then when you get into June, then it's an inch and a half and into July where our hot months inch and three quarters. So everything is ebbing and flowing depending on evaporation. And I guess the, you know, you shouldn't water in the heat of the day, right? I mean, that's kind of, no, it's hit it early in the morning. I think, I think we've got a lot of rumors out there and golf courses do a process called syringing. And that's where they actually water in the heat of the day just to cool it down. But they're only doing it for about five minutes. It's it's kind of like if you were to just get in the shower real quick and put on cool water, it you're not going to burn the lawn. And that's usually what they try to preach. The, the old wives tale is, is you're going to burn the lawn. And that's not the case. Storms roll through. We get a lot of things going on. Watering midday to syringe it is totally fine. The reason why you don't want to do a full watering midday is because of evaporation. You're going to get 40 to 60% of evaporation. So what you think is going down is not actually going down. So I preach your last cycle should be 30 minutes before or after sunup. It should be fine because we also don't want that water sitting on the top layers for very long because you'll end up popping a fungal spore and some fungus is more aggressive than others and then you end up having a whole subset of problems. And before we really talk about nutrients and things like that, so I know there are other things that are really important. And um, you know, it seems like we have trouble with shade. So uh, one of the things that I see most commonly when I'm going to somebody's house to list, if they have big trees, it's either thin or it's bare. Yeah. Um, are there any uh, tricks? I mean, you know, you you see hardware stores, sure. Home Depot, Lowe's. There, I mean, they're they're selling shade seed. Um, is there such a thing as shade seed? <laughs> yes and no. Um, there are grasses like fine fescue. Let's just talk about red fine fescue or creeping fine fescue. Um, it's a very thin kind of bladed grass. Uh, it has a tolerance of needing up to three hours of direct sunlight. So if you have anything less than three hours of direct sunlight, you're really not going to be growing much. You can go to a turf type tall fescue, again, threshold three to five hours of direct sunlight. So in those areas that surround trees, what I always try to educate people, if you have a tree big enough, put a table and chairs underneath, put some bark underneath it, have a nice area subject to shade. And when you're getting into your landscaping bit, get on paper, have a functional lawn. And this is where I tell people, what do you want to do with it? Do you have kids? If if so, do you want a horseshoe pit? Do you want to throw darts? Do you, do you want to do anything other than just play on grass? Because at the end of the week, you're going to have to mow that grass a specific amount of time to keep it nice. And so especially when it comes to shade areas, better just put a hammock there and call it a day if you're not getting three to four hours of direct sunlight. So and, save your money on the shade seed. If you yeah, don't get three. And it, it's grass specific. I mean, if you've got Bermuda lawns, if you're in a transition loan you, or transition zone where you have warm season grass, Bermuda will literally hit shade and just stop. Like Bermuda needs five to six hours of direct sunlight, period. Um, and then that's where you get into St. Augustine, but then you have this mismatch of different types of grasses. And a lot of people just don't like that look. And, you know, um, that kind of leads us into the next thing. You said grass cutting. Um, you know, I see a lot of times where, you know, people try and have a nice lawn. They even go to the extent of, you know, hiring a professional and then they just don't cut it right. They let it get too long. Sure. Um, and then the lawn, it clumps and they just leave those clumps on the lawn and then they end up dying out. Yep. Um, can you give us some tips on cutting? Yeah, cutting is very simple. 
Number one, you need to know your grass type because the grass type will tell you the threshold of how low it can go. Most grass types, including Bermuda, can go up two, three inches. Um, however, your length of cut is going to be dictated by how many times per week you're willing to mow. So, for example, I'm in a cool season zone, so I have Kentucky bluegrass in my backyard, perennial rye in my front. I keep mine at about three quarter inch to one inch is kind of my sweet spot. But anytime I get below three quarter inch, I'm mowing daily. At three quarter inch to one inch, I'm mowing four day, four to five days a week. Anytime I get up to two inches, I'm mowing twice a week. And anytime I'm at three to four inches high, I'm mowing once a week. Now, as far as it comes to whether you should bag your grass or whether you should do what's called mulching, where you leave the clippings there, you're not properly mulching if you're seeing evidence of dead grass or grass clippings behind you. And so I find that with traditional mowers, if you are not willing to mow, I should say traditional residential mowers, if you're not willing to mow twice a week, even at three to four inches in length, you're really not mulching very well. You're just going to form a weed barrier on top of the soil and eventually your grass is going to die out because you're suffocating it. How many times do you cut your grass a week? Yeah, right. Uh, at a minimum five. Really? Yeah, it's awesome. I, I've got checker patterns. I've got zigzags. I've got, you know, cross hatches. I've got waves that I do. My kids absolutely love it. It feels like a, a beach underneath their feet because I go out there and I level it with sand and make it all primp. There's so you a, must have like a, a, like a three by five foot lawn area. I mean, you just kind of have everybody <laughs> stand in one spot or they take turns st standing on the lawn. It's, it's not that bad. It's uh, it's about 2,700 square feet of lawn. And just keep in mind where people kind of lose their brains is they they remember how much it hurts to mow once a week because they, they go 20 feet or less and they have to take the bagger out and they have to empty the bag. You know, when you're mowing daily, I'm literally shaving this much off the top or less. And so I'm not taking a lot off and the grass doesn't stress out. And so I'm not stopping the mower. I'm going, yeah. it only takes in 2,700 square feet, takes me 15 minutes or less. Yeah. I mean, for, man, I, I, you know, most of the lawns around here, I mean, we have people that have half acres, acres, oh, things yeah. like that, five acres. I mean, they're, you know, they are definitely cutting once every week or once every 10 days. I know yeah. uh, sometimes if the weather's kind of wet, I mean, it's like 10 days for me. Sure. Um, so yeah, well, that's crazy. Well, guys, if you want to cut your lawn and you want a three quarters of an inch or an inch, I'm sure it looks great. You can have che checkered patterns like the ginger here. Um, and you can do that at three inches too. It just, yeah. you just go out and buy yourself a stripe kit. It's a little roller. It almost looks like you're rolling dough. Okay. Really? And it's it makes mowing fun, especially for kids. It's the best sixty dollar investment you can do for wow. kids, because yeah. they can see what they're doing. And at three inches, it stripes like a boss. It really huh. does. I just like that nice tight look of three quarter inch to one inch. Yeah. It's just a preference. It's not something that anybody has to do. But again, I recommend mowing twice a week. It will keep your sanity because you're not bagging as much and your grass right. is going to look twice as green because it's not going under as much stress. Got it. So let's talk a little bit about the uh, chemical side of things or even sure. organic lawn care. You know, here mm -hmm. in Maryland, we actually have one of the first counties in the state that outlawed pesticide use on the lawn. So, you know, we get it a lot, you know, um, you can smell it when the companies are going out and spraying. And so sure. we, we hear a lot, you know, is it safe for the dogs? Is it, you know, safe for right. us? Um, you know, if somebody wants to have, I mean, me personally, I don't even mind weeds in the yard. You could probably mm -hmm. do a weed identification class in my, my own turf, <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, and, and touch on all of them. I think I have probably every one of them, but uh, we don't do anything to it. We just sure. cut it and that's it. But if somebody wants to have a 
a weed free lawn. Right. Now, what are some of the things that they need to do in order to do that? So you kind of have to make a choice usually between treating the weeds and creating more grass. But in your instance where they're cutting out pesticides and herbicides are usually classified as pesticides, right? So what ends up happening is, is the organic side isn't super functional. And a matter of fact, on the organic side, I'm, I'm kind of a proponent against a lot of it. Because when it comes to killing weeds, you're dealing with uh, vinegar, baking soda mix with water. And if you've ever done this before, the water heats up like crazy. But one thing that people don't understand is, is you, you completely wreck your soil profile. All the beneficial bacteria that's in it, the minute you spray that, it kills everything, including the beneficial bacteria in the soil. So if you're going to go that route, you need to understand one principle, and that's actually it's a non-selective herbicide, meaning whatever it touches, it's going to kill. So if you're going to go that route, you're going to have little hockey pucks everywhere in your lawn of dead grass, dead soil. And oftentimes, if you put too much down, it's going to sterilize that soil anywhere between three weeks and three months. And then you have to scrape the top a little bit, replace a little bit of dirt to get the grass to grow back in. If you have grass that grows back in, and that's the frustrating part, if you don't know what kind of grass you have. So my suggestion is to get a weed pulling tool, keep it straight off the doorstep. Every time you leave the house, pick five to 10 and then call it. Just don't, don't even think about it anymore. All you do is you pick five to 10, you call it. Then the rest of it is every spring and fall, you should be seeding, especially if you have a turf type tall fescue, perennial ryegrass, any grass that is not steadily creeping and growing actively sideways or laterally. And so spring and fall, you're going to want to overseed. And then the rest of it just comes down to proper cutting and proper watering. Pretty simple. So you you think you can get a a pretty weed free lawn then without using weed controls? Yeah, absolutely. Where where the dysfunction is going to come in is when you get grass type weeds like Poa Noa or Poa trivialis. Um, it's a it's a annual bluegrass that actually spreads laterally and the seeds can stay in the soil profile for up to three years. So you'll still have grass. It may not be the most desirable grass, but that's where things get tricky. And then you just have to dig it out, replace the dirt, huck it and go from there. But plenty of ways to have a nice looking lawn. It just requires work. So how about like around here, we have a lot of crabgrass. In fact, it's like, we just say it's like God's natural ground cover. If you have a <laughs> thin lawn, sure. uh, you're going to have crabgrass. If you have those spots sure. that you're talking about where, you know, it's kind of like hockey pucks throughout or the dog goes and kills the grass, right. um, you know, we're going to get, we're going to have crabgrass germinate here. I don't know, probably April or May, you'll start to mm -hmm. see it. Um, you had mentioned seeding. What about if you're if you want to seed in the in the spring? I mean, what do you sacrifice because the crabgrass controls sure. typically go down in the spring? So at what point do you know should you put a crabgrass control down um, and worry about seeding in the fall? Or at what is the cutoff? I mean, what do you recommend? Yeah, and that's that age-old question of expectations, uh, really. Uh, springtime overseeding is more difficult than seeding in the fall time. And so it's traditionally better, especially for beginners, to seed in the fall time because you're not fighting as much evaporation and you have much more control over the weather being steady. Um, and some of the seed that doesn't germinate is going to overwinter anyway, and it's, it's going to end up germinating in the springtime. But typically when it comes to choosing one over the other, you have to look, okay, did last year, did I have a heavy yield of annual grasses like crabgrass, orchard grass, foxtail? If you had a heavy yield, then it's better to use what you're calling a pre-emergent or an application that helps disrupt seed germination. But you have to choose. If you're going to go that route, you're not going to be able to seed with grass seed. It doesn't work selectively like that other than one product called Tenacity. And that's just for cool season grasses like Kentucky bluegrass, perennial rye, uh, and turf type tall fescue, and a couple of warm season grass. I believe it, don't quote me on this, but centipede grass, St. Augustine. Could be wrong. But 
um, for the most part, tenacity only lasts about three weeks as a pre-emergent where the rest of them like uh, dithiopyr and prodiamine, they're, you, they're going to yield almost three months of protection if you're putting it down properly and you're watering correctly. So you just kind of have to look at the season before you and say, okay, I, I had a lot of problems last year. Probably be better if I focus on the weed control now. Um, and I deal with a sparse looking lawn and then I can rebuild that in the fall. I think you said something that's kind of really important because I see people do this. So they'll have a lawn care company. Let's just say, you know, the springtime is a very popular time to put their house in the market. Right. Um, and they want to green it up. They want it to look nice. So they'll call the lawn company that will come out yep. and then they'll put down, I guess, that first application of pre-emergence, that crabgrass or I guess, whatever annual grass that can germinate by seed in the spring. And then they think they're doing a good job by seeding thereafter. And you're right. saying that this pre-emergence is non-selective, most of it. So it's Correct. killing the grass seed, right? I mean, so Correct. if you're, you're having that lawn company put down that crabgrass control, and let's just say that's done in March. Mm-hmm. And then they go ahead in April and seed, they're wasting their money. Yeah, it definitely can. Now, some people get in a pickle, right? Because they have buyer's remorse. They're like, well, I really wanted to seed as opposed to not, as opposed to killing crabgrass. Well, at that point, there's a couple of workarounds. You can aerate your lawn and really just pull up the plugs. No pre-emergent is going to be 100% effective. Trust me on this. No pre-emergent. Um, but also, your seed yield is going to be affected by how well it can actually get to the soil. So my recommendation before seeding is always to dethatch your lawn, which contrary to the word dethatch, not actually removing thatch, you're just removing dead grass that was left by the mower over seasons and seasons and seasons. So, but I like what you're saying in regards to selectiveness of the pre-emergence. The majority of them are non-selective, meaning they don't discriminate. If it's a seed that's trying to germinate, it's, it's going to disrupt that process. It doesn't stop germination. It doesn't kill the weed seed. It just disrupts the germinating process. And so those pre-emergence are best put down before the soil hits 50 degrees for five days straight. Got it. We have a saying around here in Maryland, and I don't know if it's other parts in the country, but the old wise tale are saying, and maybe there's truth to it, but my grandparents used to say that if you're going to put down those crabgrass pre-emergence, um, the crabgrass pre-emergence, then you have to do it before the forsythia plants lose their bloom i don't know yes. if there's any truth to that or whatever but that was always the rule in in my grandparents house was hey you know what the you know for are getting ready to lose their bloom if you're going to do a weed control or pre-emergence you need to get it down before then um so you had said with seeding you talked about aerating uh most people don't have these machines sure. so um if they're going to seed, you always recommend doing aeration before and then, or can you just spread the seed down on top? No cover, no straw or whatever covering. Will sure. it work that way or does it have to go in the ground? It's a good question. The only fundamental to it is seed to soil contact. That's the only thing that matters. And so when you aerate and you're really just tilling the ground, you're increasing that seed to soil contact. No matter how bad your thatch is or no matter how, how much garbage or debris that you have on the soil surface, you're increasing seed to soil contact. So that is the only thing. Now me, I'm a lawn care nut through and through. Like I enjoy this stuff, but there's some people out there, they don't care about having golf course quality grass. They just want to have a decently lush and thick grass. And that's totally fine too. It depends on your lawn goals. My recommendation, there's such a, this, this device just blows my mind how cheap it is for 150 bucks usually. And it ebbs and flows in prices between 150 and 250 bucks. You can get one of these Sun Joe or Earthwise or uh, Greenworks D thatchers. Um, 
and literally they do two thirds the work as my two thousand dollar dethatcher that we use for our work we we don't provide that service but we used to a long time ago and i've been shocked at how these little fisher price toys how well they actually work um i like the sun joe and I've got video after video after video on the Sunjo Dethatcher and Scarifier, but it comes with what's called a Scarifier. And that Scarifier is perfect for seeding because it digs slits and ruts through the grass. Perfect for that seed to drop into. Most of your seed doesn't want to be much deeper than about an eighth of an inch in the soil. And at the same time, it's going to remove what's actual thatch. It's a spongy layer of root ball mass that traditionally after it gets out of control, it starts growing upward. It's gonna help thin that out, increase uh, seed to soil contact, and also make your lawn look better by taking the garbage out because your eye naturally goes to the things that are darkest and dead grass turns brown uh, and eventually gray. And when that happens is it clouds your color. So you may actually have really good color, but it's being clouded by all the garbage in the lawn. So these cheap devices, make it so much easier it's, it's probably my number one recommended tool for a homeowner i know a lot of people out there want to say that the number one recommended tool is having a really good um watering control system and i i'm a fixer i like to fix things so that's for them this is my number one recommendation for lawn problems so let's talk about if you want that you know stepped up um, you know, lawn, you know, you're, you want a more than just green, you want it weed free. Sure. You want to go with like a Scott's four step application mm -hmm. is what we see a lot being sold here in the home centers. Sure. Um, you know, let, let's, there's a couple of things. We'll just kind of take it from the top. There's settings, spreader settings. So if you're, this is you, you want to have a nice lawn, you want to put down a four-step mm -hmm. program. What do they need? I, you know, you see these drop spreaders, you see broadcast spreaders. Sure. Are there benefits of one over the other? Uh, what do you use? What are the pros you use? Um, the, the pros, we're, we're using spiker, spiker spreaders. They're about six to $700 each. You can get them as cheap as $300. The difference is how big the hopper is, right? The difference is, is they can take a beating. Uh, the settings don't change. Uh, however, to answer your question, it doesn't matter. I people laugh at me because I'll use a handheld spreader on my own lawn. It, you know, the only thing that matters is how many pounds go on the ground, and you really just don't want to exceed more than anywhere between a half pound and a full pound of nitrogen at any given moment. And it's really easy to calculate that. You just take the number 100, divide it by the bag number, and that will tell you how many pounds to get to one pound of nitrogen. So how many pounds of product to get to one pound of nitrogen? Um, very, very simple. So if I have a bag that is 20, doesn't matter what the other two numbers are, they, it could be a 20, 10, 5, right? The first number is nitrogen, second number is phosphorus, third number is potassium. That means... 100 divided by 20 is five. So five pounds of product will get me to one pound of nitrogen per 1,000 square feet. So if you don't know what a thousand square feet looks like, it's a 50 by 20 foot area. And if you're not sure what that looks like, or you're saying, oh, my yard is misshapen, get onto google.com forward slash maps, and then go right on an aerial view of your lawn, right click, and it will have an option that says measure. And you can create a bunch of little dots around your area and it will tell you how many thousand square feet you have. That way you know exactly what you're dealing with. But the last thing that you wanna do is start guessing. And these four step plans, they're decent. Um, I'm not gonna knock them. Um, I think that there's value to it because in my area, for instance, very, very cold, very cold. And the only thing the grass even knows what to do when it gets this cold around 40 degrees soil temps when we start, it only knows how to use nitrogen and potassium. 
the rest of it, we're waiting for the ground temps to get to 50. Then we can start introducing irons and a bunch of other things. Now, there's some uh, exemptions to these rules. Like you can do stacking of nutrients. That is a real thing. And by the time the grass knows what to do with it, it's there. Um, but these programs oftentimes are regional programs. And that's what you hope that they know what they're doing and not just selling you a product. Um, because, for instance, in my area, it's useless to put down urea before the ground temps hit 50 degrees because it's not going to do anything. So we use ammonium sulfates, ammonium nitrates, um, just different types of ammoniums other than urea to make sure that that grass is growing properly. Um, and we're not putting all these chemicals back into our waterways. So we, we do want to keep it safe. I know here in Maryland, we have a uh, fertilizer act. I think, uh, I don't remember what year it came out, but a while ago, and we're not allowed to use in lawn care besides the County. Now, uh, Montgomery County that is outlawed the use of pesticides, uh, residential lawns. I know that we have a, uh, no phosphorus law, you know, where unless you're, and I completely agree tests, with that law. Yeah. Do you? I and I know with the Bay, you know, there's, uh, so they've cut back uh, phosphorus for regular lawn care. Correct. Well, they've eliminated it unless you're seeding and you can prove that you're deficient in it. And the other thing is we've gone from the one pound per thousand square feet of nitrogen uh, to 0.9 pounds per square foot. So uh, definitely, I'm, I'm sure, and you probably may even know, I mean, are there other states that have those varying differences yeah there's a lot every, every state will be different uh, it's usually not insane in the regions on differences like my lawn my soil profile is going to be slightly different than my neighbors because i do a lot of stuff to change my soil profile so my ph is coming in at around 6.8 where my neighbors is about a 7.2 same test same everything my suggestion is to everybody that wants to step it up or be ecologically sound and safe, get a soil test. There's my soil. I'm going to be, I, I, I'm not, they, I have a slight affiliate program with them where they give me pennies. Um, but the reason why I like them is because the kit is so easy to use. You literally can buy their two, I think it comes with two kits and a little soil sampler to it. I think it's like 90 bucks. It's a decent deal. And then each kit after that is only like $35. But you go through, you plug seven areas front and back. You put the, the matter in the box. You remove all the green and the brown tissue. So you just have soil. You put a scoop in, put it in water, shake it, put it in the envelope, send it back. And seriously, within five to seven days, you know what you need to put on the ground. Because again, the reason why I'm for phosphorus bands, right? It poisons our waterways. When we have high phosphorus, traditionally we're gonna start seeing low um, iron counts as well as low zinc. Not all the time, there's always exceptions, but the last thing we wanna do is keep putting more of something we already are high in. It just makes no sense whatsoever because that's what ends up leaching. But it also diseases your plants as well. High phosphorus causes a lot of problems hmm. from fungal matters and low micronutrient counts um, to you'll just start seeing random dead areas, you know, for a lot of people. So you brought up an interesting point. You said, so this, this testing process, you know, a lot of people think, that when they're doing a soil test that they'll just do one spot in the yard. Correct. And you said seven. Is it important then? So are we looking for, are you mixing these seven plugs together? Or are these individual tests that are done for each section that you've plugged? Yeah. So we're going to, we're going to mix them all together. And, and here's the truth. The truth is, is your micronutrients and your macronutrients can change every half inch through the lawn. I mean, your lawn is a living substance. Your grass is a living substance, but we don't really care about that. We care about what's in the soil because that's what the grass is taking from. 
That's what your plants are taking from the trees, the shrubs, the bushes, everything. So we want to know what's in the soil. And so, but we also want a generality of what's in the soil. What's high, what's low. So my lawn, very low in nitrogen, very low in potassium, really high in phosphorus. Well, what ends up happening is, is when we get really high phosphorus, worst case scenario in our waterways, we get what's called algal bloom. It's where nitrogen encases phosphorus and it, uh, it gets encased in algae as well. It's very poisonous. It can kill dogs. It can kill small animals. Not cool to have. Well, when we're pumping more fertilizer that's got more phosphorus in it, it completely washes into these waterways too. So not cool to, to keep doing that. And so I am a, a huge proponent of safety first, but short answer is yes. We want to know what's around the entire lawn and not just in one area because it can change. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, I, you think about it. So every lawn is different. The nutrients change from sample to sample, but yet when you go in and you buy your products, you're buying pre-bag products, a four-step oh, yeah. lawn program that everybody puts on every lawn and yep. so forth. So is the importance of doing the soil sampling, is is that for the use of micronutrients? I mean, the soil samples that are coming back, are they giving you recommendations beyond the typical products that you're buying in a bag with a four-step program? Are they saying also add this to the to the lawn area? So that will all depend on the soil sample that you choose to buy. A lot of people like to go to their state ag department. Now, what ends up happening is, is they usually get three numbers back and it's nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. That's it. Um, and the problem with this is very incomplete because a lot of what your soil needs are micronutrients. And these are not as well known uh, for people unless they've been to a nursery and they really like their flowers, right? <laughs> because when you like flowers and plants, you're all in. Uh, you want to know also, you want a complete test that is going to show your secondary primaries like iron and calcium. Um, and also micronutrients like uh, your, uh, your FE counts of iron. Uh, but also boron, manganese, uh, chlorine, uh, molybdenum, and these are your what's called micronutrients. The difference is kind of like whole wheat, pasta, spaghetti, steak, right? We call those carbohydrates, proteins. Those are macronutrients. Uh, and then you'd have fats for your body. Well, your lawn has a, another segment called micronutrients, and we would consider these micronutrients like when people go out and they juice, and they really just want to slam in vitamin C, vitamin D, vitamin B6, vitamin B12. Your lawn needs the same thing. And so those micronutrients are very important to know. Because For instance, my lawn is extremely low in zinc, extremely low in iron. Um, and I have really have to pump it hard in those areas with nitrogen and potassium as my macros. And then my micronutrients is a whole subset of categories. So if you really want to get that next step having a soil sample taken that can give you suggestions and products. And not all soil samples will give you soil suggestions. However, the My Soil Kits um, that, that we have are. And I have a video on it. I think it's uh, how to choose the perfect fertilizer. Um, and it has direct links to it. But they'll, they'll tell you, okay, these are the products that we recommend. Or you can find them at your local store with similar numbers. So, you know, dogs. Let's talk about dogs you know yeah. a lot of people have them we have a lot of condos around here too sure. and they allow dogs or even apartment complexes and things like right. that and so people take their dogs out and the first thing the dog does is the dog pees right i mean right. it's been in for hours or whatever <laughs> and they just so happen to do it right by the front door and a lot of times you know a lot of cases in these condo complexes and things like that and it kills the grass. Is there anything to do about that? I mean, it, you know, you've heard where people say, well, if you give your dog this or no water or that or whatever, sure. um, it's urine won't be. Yeah. Or as... it's just the girl dogs. That's my favorite one. It's just yeah. the girl so dogs. Is there any truth to any of this? Uh, yes and no. Um, it depends on the dog, really. What, what they're doing is they're creating ammonium. 
uh, through their urine, it, it gets really, it's not even the how hot the urine is, it's just how acidic it is. And sometimes just changing to not even distilled water, but alkaline water uh, will help that out, changing diet. Um, I like to be careful with some of these things because you don't want to give your dog kidney stones. Uh, you know, people don't think about this stuff either. Um, some of it could be beneficial. I'd say talk to your veterinarian first before making any drastic changes. When you have a lot of dog urine spot in a given lawn, it's typically because the amount of urine in that one spot is too much. And you'll notice the outside of the grass is actually lush green and growing pretty crazy. So you've got a company like Revive who actually sells a dog urine spot preventer. It's a little annoying because you have to go out there just about every other day and spray the spots. You know, some, some of the products will say go out once a week or go out once every two weeks. No problem. What I have found is, is if you take a calcium product, let's just assume that your calcium is not already through the roof. But if you have a pH of say 7.5, then you can use, excuse me, gypsum soil which is what I prefer to use for dog urine spot. Um, and But you have to put a ton of it out. Like I'm talking like 25 pounds per thousand on the first app starting in April. And then every other month after that, I'm putting down 10 pounds per thousand square feet. It's a lot. But I also like to use Humates as well in one bag. Or if I can find them separate, then I'll use them separately. But that is typically what I'm doing to prevent dog urine spot. Now, the smartest thing that you could do for a condo is to go on Amazon, purchase one of those uh, fake grasses, boxes, you know, just turf grass. It's usually in like a three foot by two foot or a three foot by three or a three by four. You can put some uh, some pheromones on it or some dog urine from another dog. Don't ask me how you're going to get that. I don't know. <laughs> um, but you typically put the pheromone on it. You train the dog to pee on that. Um, I personally, I like to train my dogs to, to defecate in the, by bushes and do their peeing in one spot. So you can buy like a toy, like fire hydrant, which dogs usually love. It's kind of hilarious. And then you just treat train them, you know, treat train the dog. Hey, good job peeing right there. And eventually they'll just keep doing it. So it just depends on your goals. Um, my, the, the things that I do, they work, but they are area specific because if you already have low, low pH and it's a 5.5, five, you might have to do a Lyme application instead of once a year. You might have to do it three times a year um, just to make sure that you're constantly bumping that pH back up. But I will tell you, much easier to go pH up than it is pH down. So you don't want to use too much Lyme because if you get past that threshold, it's going to be harder to get it to come back down. So you never want to push it too hard. I'm glad you mentioned Lyme. So, you know, a lot of people just think it's the fall. They're going to seed. Let's go ahead and lime the yard. Sure. And they get that pulverized lime and they look like, you know, they've got it everywhere. Just puffs of <laughs> white dust everywhere. Yeah. Um, what give us some tips on liming i mean it's so you know you've mentioned ph a bunch of times sure um is that like one of the most important things to know about your lawn uh it's it's very important i i've you know most people have no clue i can't tell you how many times i'll travel and i'll just call fertilizer companies and i'll be like hey i'm just here for a day i'm doing a segment on what's wrong with my lawn um can you please just tell me you know what the ph is and nine times out of, well, let's even say 99 out of 100, they'll, they'll, they'll just say, I don't know. And so my secondary question, okay, do you guys use lime or gypsum? Well, obviously we use lime. <laughs> and then I'll be like, oh, okay. Now I know you guys are below a six. You know, I don't know where below a six you are, but you're below a six. Now I, I, I talk about this a lot because hot tubs, you mentioned the word hot tub and pH. People go, oh, yeah, I get that. Well, the reason why is because if your water goes too acidic or too alkaline, you end up with hot tub rash, something that you're going to remember. You know, it looks like little bed bug bites all over your body. So 
it's kind of one of those things that, yes, when you start looking into calcium, you want to know. Because if you're like a five, you might be using 25 pounds of lime per thousand square feet. But if you're already at a six and you just need to get it to six, five to a seven, depending on your grass type, it's fantastic. You know, you're not going to use that much. Um, but then on the flip side, if you're at like a 7.9, then you're going to be using gypsum or elemental sulfur to really pull that down. Different grass types like Kentucky bluegrass loves 6.5. That's, that's where it's going to grow the most. So every single time we fertilize with nitrogen for about three days, we're pulling that pH down. And that's the part that people have a mishap with. They don't understand the process. It's pulling it down temporarily to get into that growing medium. So we spike in growth. Now, when your pH is already low and you're adding more salt to make it lower, we're not getting into that growing medium. So if you look at perennial rye, you look at different types of turf type tall fescue, those types of grasses really like it between five, five and a six. And so they like it a little bit more acidic, but at the same point, if you're already below a five, you're not getting into that medium. So you have to pull it up. You're already at a seven, you're pulling it down. So how long does it take to adjust the pH? So if people are putting lime down and they're expecting that it's going to instantly change the pH, I mean, is that something that it takes, does it take years to change the pH in soil? So the one thing that, that I try to explain to people, you're not fixing anything. You're not. Mother Nature has been winning this battle for millions of years. You're just not going to fix it. It just needs to become part of your regimen on what you're normally used to doing. Elemental gotcha. sulfur will give you the longest lasting results. But again, you're not fixing it. If you want to fix it, grab yourself a track hoe, dig six feet under, replace the soil. <laughs> Good luck. Six foot, six foot of dirt. How about yep. top dressing and things like that? Do you recommend that? Oh, uh, you had it. mentioned, you know, you doing some preventive um, soil to your lawn if you have dogs, if you really want to get into that. Um but what about top dressing with compost and things like that? Important or not? Anytime you're using organic uh, carbons, and I'm talking like topsoil like you're talking about, that is by far the quickest way to change a lawn, period. Um, I've got a, a ton of clay, just, and it is hard compact you go back to my videos when i moved into this house four years ago you know everybody's looking at the lawn and just say you're just gonna have to wait you know this is not going to change overnight but one of the things that i started doing was amending my soil where i would do what's called a, an aerification so i'd take an aerator we'd aerate it three or four times and then i would dig out all the plugs so i i take the plugs i throw them away and then we bring in fine sand that is screened to two millimeters or less. Golf courses have been doing this process for as long as they've been around. They're amending the soil to make it easier for the grass to penetrate. So I've done this process of top dressing uh, with sand, but sand contains zero nutrients. So when you get into areas with sand, you want to do the opposite. You want to bring in a nice compost. Um, that's, that's an organic. And I, I tell people to get a garden topsoil because you want to increase the soil profile unless you're going to be fertilizing once every two weeks. If you've got all sand, it's not enough nutrients. The nutrients are just falling through. So it just depends on what you're looking to do. But yes, fastest, quickest way to solve a problem. Let's say you have a, a lawn that is so hard compact but also, I don't know if you've ever seen this where the water literally just runs off, right? We call that process hydrophobic. I fix it by using chicken manure or DPW. Um, and that just reintroduces the, the bacteria and everything to hold the soil back together. But even quicker than that is just top dressing it with a composting soil. It is the fastest way to turn a lawn around. It's fantastic. It's it's really practiced a lot back east. Um, the further west you get, they don't practice as much. And I honestly, I think it's just, it costs a lot to rent a dump truck 
and to rent uh, these machines like the eco spreaders, which are incredible, that have a hopper that also shoot it out. Um, but yeah, it's a fantastic way of doing it. How do you deal with moss, moss and al algae? So, you know, here we get a lot of sure. areas where, you know, they're on the north side. Um, and it seems like the moss just kind of, as it starts to spread, it just kills the grass off. Like nothing else will grow there. If you go to take it off, it comes up in like mats. And then you seed, but it seems like it continually comes back again. So, yeah. you know, how does somebody take care of that? Here's a bunch of products out there. Uh, again, going back to the Sun Joe D Thatcher, it's got these tines that are built um, almost like springs that or paper clips that have been formed. It just looks like this and it scores the ground. Very non-invasive to the grass, but it does a great job, fantastic job disrupting algae and moss. Um, the other thing is, is regular treatments with chelated iron. Usually means your iron counts are also low. Um, the final thing is, is water. Huge aspect of this. If you are over watering, you're increasing your chances of getting moss. Um, number four, too much shade for the grass type that you have. So in those instances, I find a lot around uh, fence lines. So my suggestion is, is bump out your lawn three feet, make those into garden areas. It doesn't mean that you have to grow carrots or anything, but put, put some uh, hostas or something that doesn't need a lot of light in those areas. Awesome, man. This is all good stuff. So you had mentioned, and we'll just kind of um, wrap up with this, but so if, if, if someone is selling their house and they want to turn it around quick, you had mentioned one of the fastest ways to do it is to top dress it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of, can you give any other tips? You, somebody calls you up and says, I just want to get the lawn, quick shot to it, get it green. What kind of top dressing what type of grass seed grows fast and what are what are some some tricks of the trade so football fields if you look at them traditionally when you're in a stadium uh they're they're going to be using a combination of kentucky bluegrass and perennial rye you just have to understand that kentucky bluegrass it takes a it's difficult to germinate 21 days um where perennial rye five days it's fast Perennial ryegrass is one of the easiest grass I've ever dealt with. Uh, it looks good. It feels good. Um, so overseeding with perennial ryegrass is, is fantastic. Now, if you're getting into a bridesmaid situation where you don't have a lot of grass, things are looking horrible, and you just need a, something quick fix, the new popular thing lately, it's actually been to spray it with dye. So they actually have dirt, turf dyes out there. They're not super cheap. Uh, but it'll get you out of a pickle. Spray the dirt. You know it. They'll do it. It's right. Yep. Wow. Yep. All right, man. And and that's kind of one of those things where we get a little frustrated in the lawn care community uh, with these because you'll get channels, and I'm not naming any names and or anything, but these these channels will do befores and afters, or possibly do befores and afters. And, you know, where not enough time has passed and it's, it's usually paint. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. All right. Well, there you have it guys. I mean, if you want a nice lawn, no matter what, you know, if you don't care about the weeds or you want to go full blown lawn program, uh, you heard it pest and lawn ginger. And so what, what, let's, how'd you get that name? <laughs> <laughs> the name um growing up as a redhead you find real quick that uh other kids are a little ruthless about things that are different right so i got made fun of my whole entire life and i got into my mid-20s and i noticed uh back in great britain there was this movement of gingers and it was almost coming across as a swear word and i thought it was kind of funny so i changed uh changed my facebook over to ginger and people started calling me ginger then and then uh, when I started filming for YouTube, I'm like, you know what? It's just kind of hard to say pest and lawn ginger. It just doesn't have that pizzazz, you know? So there's a couple of uh, there's a couple of songs from Great Britain talking about hard R's. So, you know, you can't say the hard R. And and so it was ginger, you know, it was, it was kind of funny. So, but 
ultimately i knew i'd known about that song but i'd also flirted with the idea of being a, a lawn ninja and combining the two ginger and ninja i was like ah, ginger is suiting it fits and it really just kind of took off so everybody you know i i'm a firm believer that nicknames are given they're not chosen and everybody's just like oh ginger that's awesome but we like the <laughs> ginger so kind of adopted it after the people's choice there you go that's awesome well we really appreciate your time oh a lot of fun being here todd appreciate you guys and uh if there's anything i can do you know keep yeah. slaying those lawns check out my youtube page instagram it's the easiest way to get hold of me that's awesome well guys go grow some grass go slay some lawns and until next week we'll see you soon Sachs Realty, Maryland Broker, number 607720, office number 443-318-4514, equal housing opportunity.